Okay, and this uh, final lecture of this module, we're going to be discussing religion. <clears throat> so first of all, what we should talk about is uh, sociology's overall uh, attitude or, or, per, or uh, uh, goals when it comes to addressing uh, religion. Um, and the first note up there is uh, that sociology in no way, uh, and put up there, does not attempt in any way to validate any one religion or, in fact, any religion's ideas about uh, truth when it comes to um, uh, religion's teachings or doctrines. So religions, by definition, give us an explanation of um, otherworldly or spiritual matters. And sociology in no way uh, tries to uh, compare or judge uh, one religion as being quote unquote right, where another one is not right, or compare them in ways that in, implies, like I said, values or judgment uh, imposed on uh, what religious teachings are. Uh, what sociology does attempt to do is study the effect of religions on people's interactions and behaviors. So in other words, sociologists are not out to try to figure out which is the correct or right religion, but rather to uh, determine uh, how religion affects society by studying the ways that it affects the individuals who make up society. Um, Emil Durkheim, as we've talked a number of times about through the semester, a very, uh, very, very important sociologist, um, uh, was very, very interested in, in uh, uh, aspects of religion and the study of religion. <clears throat> and basically, kind of all through his writings uh, uh, and, and self-admittedly, found it impossible to try to identify uh, elements, uh, sociological elements or elements of society that are common across all religions. Uh, so in other words, uh, there's almost nothing that all religions have in common about the only thing uh, that uh, Durkheim was able to talk about as being a commonality uh, is that religions make definitions between what is considered the sacred and the profane. And by that, uh, religions make definitions about what is sacred, in other words, things having to do uh, with uh, spirituality or definitions of an afterlife or a higher being, those things which are, again, related to being spiritual, and uh, definitions about what is profane, in other words, uh, kind of of this world or kind of everyday ordinary things and that religions make a differentiation between those two things, and that seems obvious, uh, but that's about the only thing that Durkheim really found was a common uh, thread amongst all religions is this definition or this uh, distinction between definitions of what is sacred and what is profane. Um, so obviously not a lot to work with there, uh, although Durkheim did say that religion basically, there are three elements which uh, help to find a religion, and that is beliefs, again, beliefs that there are things uh, that transcend the profane, in other words, there are, there are things that uh, are defined as spiritual or sacred beliefs, um, that then religion establishes practices which center on recognizing uh, the difference between what is profane and sacred, and obviously focusing more on uh, those things which are sacred. So again, a belief in a higher power, a belief in an afterlife, uh, those kind of things would be considered spiritual and that religions then would develop practices uh, which it passes on to individuals uh, about that. And that these beliefs and practices establish a moral community uh, among groups of people. And again, when we hear the word moral, we assume perhaps a, a, a definition that everything that those people do uh, is right or ethical, okay, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, what Durkheim meant by a moral community is again, uh, that uh, it's, it's a bunch of people who share common beliefs and, uh, and, and uh, then uh, exercise these certain practices together and that forms them into a community of shared beliefs and practices regarding sacred or spiritual matters and then that group could be called or defined as a church. We're going to see that there's a different, uh, and we typically think of church, we think of Christianity, 
but according to Durkheim, any religion can be defined as a church if there's a shared beliefs, practices, and establishment of a moral community uh, would be considered uh, a religious church. And again, that could be anything. So it could be uh, Buddhism, it could be Hinduism, it could be Judaism, it could be Islam uh, or Christianity, uh, but those are the definitions that he used. So uh, all religions, according to Durkheim, share these elements, and that's what defines a religion. Um, when we take a look at religion, again, from the three uh, various uh, sociological perspectives, certainly we could look at it from a functional point of view, and functionalism would say that religion is universal because it fulfills many basic human needs, uh, that we have uh, certain needs that religion fulfills for us. Certainly, uh, functionalists would point to uh, kind of what they what would be termed as the questions of ultimate meaning. Uh, that idea of kind of what's the purpose of life, uh, why are we here, uh, why does suffering exist, what is going to happen to us after we die, and that functionalism would say that religion uh, attempts to or does address these issues and give people a sense of that there is that there are answers uh, to these incredibly uh, complex questions. Um, certainly, functionalists can point to the fact that religion provides us as human beings with a certain sense of emotional comfort. Uh, that, again, the social aspect of participating in what Durkheim called the moral community uh, gives us a sense of belonging and also helps us deal with uh, loss or stress that we experience in life. Again, that goes along with social solidarity, the idea that we can, uh, religions are often very much the basis of, uh, you know, entire communities uh, that links members together. Um, we can also say that religion provides us with guidelines for behavior. Uh, again, uh, most religions have what we consider to be some type of moral or, ethic or ethical code of behavior uh, that dictates what type of behavior we should and shouldn't do uh, in respect to uh, each other. Um, again, a lot of functionalists point to uh, the idea of religion being a powerful force for social change. Uh, that uh, many social movements are often uh, very closely tied to or actually started as religious movements. Um, so sometimes, again, we look at uh, things like the civil rights movement or, uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, today's conflicts regarding uh, abortion. Certainly a lot of people on, on a religious uh, standpoint uh, take one side of that uh, argument or the other and um, can create social change. Um, certainly uh, dysfunctions exist uh, when we talk about religion uh, and some of these we'll talk about in more detail in conflict theory but functionalists can definitely point to uh, the idea that uh, religions can certainly be a justification for persecution uh, both within and among societies, so religious differences are often used as a uh, uh, justification for uh, persecution, uh, uh, discrimination, and violence. Uh, and then again, war and terrorism are sometimes what we might call uh, dysfunctional aspects of religion. Um, to look at religion from a symbolic interactionist point of view, clearly, uh, Religion is rife with symbols, uh, attached meaning. Uh, so whether or not we talk about, you know, a Christian cross or a uh, Jewish star of David, it's not very good, or a uh, Islamic crescent. Okay, we know that these symbols have very, very, very uh, powerful attached meaning to them, um, and that. Uh, again, these religious, these symbols are, what Durkheim said, uh, representations of what is sacred, <clears throat> that then the rituals or practices that people engage in, uh, again, will tell us about what their uh, definitions are about these uh, definitions of what is sacred, um, and then again, beliefs about uh, what we sometimes refer to as cosmology. Uh, a belief in things that we cannot see or exist beyond our uh, immediate perception. So, uh, again, definitions of the afterlife or the nature of the universe or of higher being or beings uh, are, are all part of uh, the, symbols, the symbols associated with uh, religion. Um, 
And then, of course, the very uh, the last one we can talk about is conflict theory. Conflict theory is often very critical of religion, because once again, conflict theory is interested in the inequalities uh, that exist within society. Um, and one of the common uh, uh, accusations of conflict theorists about religion is that religion tends to promote then, much like we talked about with education, the status quo and therefore social inequality. Uh, Marx, in particular, was very critical of religions. Uh, one of his most famous uh, quotes referred to religion as the opiate of the masses. Um, in other words, a drug that's consumed by the masses, and much like drugs uh, in, in Marx's opinions, then uh, kept people from recognizing uh, uh, what their situation was. So in other words, workers used religion as a way to justify kind of quote, the, the way things are, and then not to work at trying to change those things. Um, and also that uh, religion, we talked about the divine right of kings, uh, sometimes talked about uh, the idea of promoting social inequality as a, just a God's will, or um, you know, uh, some people are in power because they are uh, favored of the gods, or in touch, or, or in, in, in more in touch with the sacred uh, versus the profane, uh, therefore uh, deserve to be in positions of power and wealth, those kind of things. So those are some of the aspects uh, that conflict theorists look like. When we look at various types of religions, uh, we can talk about cults. Uh, for the most part, you can say that all religions, uh, to a certain degree, or most modern religions, uh, can be said to have started as cults. Usually, if there is a dominant religion that exists at the time, any new religions that start uh, are generally usually considered by the uh, dominant religions or the society at large as cults, so we can often point to uh, the idea of cults being started by what we sometimes, when we get back to our definitions of uh, leadership and authority, uh, by charismatic leaders. Uh, clearly, we can look at Christianity as starting very much as a cult. Uh, we can say Jesus of Nazareth was a very charismatic figure, a uh, person that people followed because of his message and teachings, and then uh, but widely regarded as a cult by, uh, the, at the time, the state religion uh, in that region of the world was uh, a, a combination of Judaism and um, uh, Roman uh, religion. Uh, so typically when cults become more and more established, uh, then they can sometimes be considered sects, especially sometimes if they are incorporated or learn to incorporate the aspects of other more accepted religions uh, that they can often be defined as sects. Uh, sometimes, of course, we can say once a, once a, uh, a religion is established, and the next step we'll talk about in just a second, churches, sometimes movements within those large organizations can be considered sects. Um, but then when we typically talk about church getting to uh, the size that it becomes and starts to follow uh, the, the uh, definitions of what makes up a bureaucracy, uh, so there's definitely a hierarchy, there's definitions of leadership and organization within them, um, and usually uh, then when uh, it starts taking in and organizing and, and funneling uh, economics or finances within it, uh, then we usually say that a religion has reached the level of a church. And once again, we think of, uh, sometimes often commonly think of churches as only being uh, a term related to uh, Christianity, uh, but again, in the wider sociological definition, uh, this is a religion that's established that level of organization. And then the very uh, last type that we could talk about is the idea of ecclesia. Uh, ecclesia is when uh, churches become so integrated into society that it actually takes on uh, roles of like leadership and government. So um, what's sometimes called a state religion. So if you again you go back to uh, the idea of ancient Rome, just for an example, or you could say Egypt to a certain degree, uh, certainly religion rose to the level of being a very important part of, of rule and government, and uh, largely without um, any uh, dissension by the, by the vast majority of people. So, you know, the fact that a Roman emperor would declare him or herself, uh, in fact, several uh, Roman emperors or Caesars uh, were later on deified, meaning uh, incorporated into uh, 
the religions of, uh, in fact, called gods then. So, uh, and certainly Pharaoh uh, being a, a representation or a descendant of uh, the Egyptian uh, uh, gods. Uh, these are clearly people in power who, to, for the, the religion was the state religion, in other words, accepted uh, by society and religion becomes uh, part of the entire society's cultural leadership. So when we talk about the United States in particular, clearly there's examples of cults, sexes, and churches, and we largely say as a society that we have no state religion, that there is no religion uh, in America which is considered to be now, again, the, 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 the founding fathers certainly had one definition. Uh, certainly sometimes today we hear about you know, uh, uh, the debate about whether or not um, America is a, a Judeo-Christian. So in other words, kind of taking uh, elements of Christianity and Judaism and combining them to say, uh, and if, it, if that in fact, you know, were to be determined that society is in fact a uh, uh, Judeo-Christian nation, basically what we're declaring is then we have a state religion. And then of course, for as many people uh, who would be in favor of that, there's probably almost as many people who would say, no, we have to avoid uh, the idea of becoming or establishing an ecclesia, uh, that, there, that we are a pluralistic nation in which no religious uh, faith is considered the state religion or, in other words, given any preference over any others. So, again, that, uh, clearly that, uh, that the, the debate goes on. Um, we can certainly say that in, in our society there's a kind of constant tension between uh, religion and what we sometimes call secularization. Uh, again, if we go back to our religion clearly focuses on the sacred and what we call secular focuses on the profane, in other words, uh, kind of the, uh, the affairs of everyday life. So we can certainly say that uh, and there's uh, very often debates between, um, you know, when uh, religious groups try to uh, talk about, again, how uh, beliefs and practices should be more widespread, and secularists say that there should be more of an emphasis on uh, kind of the affairs of everyday life, leader, uh, lead more lenient guidelines, and lowering the effects of religion on, uh, let's say, public policy, or social policy, or social behaviors, then we can kind of talk about that, um, that conflict, that tension that exists between uh, religion and uh, secularization.